aire. The uh, wow, this is very formal now. We got the we got the microphone and everything. Um, so I know we've all talked about this uh, this morning speaker, but uh, just to formally uh, welcome the general and his son Shay uh, to join us here at Boathouse this morning. So um, when I was sort of doing my research on the intro, um, you know, you don't have to do a lot of work to, to find General Hammond's kind of background and bio. Um, but one thing, in, and it kind of relates to our world a little bit, um, was I, one of the pieces when you search his name that comes up is LinkedIn um, and his LinkedIn profile. And, and you know, we all, we interview a lot of people, we hire a lot of people, we go to a lot of people's LinkedIn pages um, and look at their background. And there was nothing sort of more impressive than going to General Hammond's LinkedIn page. And I figured I'd use it as sort of the bio intro basis because it's so hot shit um, to be technical. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about the fact that he's a local kid um, and uh, grew up around here and went to school around here. Um, but the first entry back in 2002 is battalion commander. Uh, again, um, <laughs> it, it's almost emotional. Um, so commanded a counterinsurgency task force designed to develop intelligence, identify terrorists and criminals and arrest them. Uh, I don't know why I'm emotional about this, but it's, it's I, I swear we're not dating. Um, but the uh, successfully conducted more than 100 operations in Iraq that resulted in the apprehension of a large number of terrorists, weapons, and bombs. Uh, in the category of shit I can't imagine, uh, and while in 2002, as we were talking about before, we were trying to figure out how to do ads for Merrill Lynch, uh, he was moving his way uh, through Iraq, uh, so pretty cool. Um, God, I uh, <laughs> gotta pull myself together. Uh, the next piece was uh, sort of strategic planning and ops officer for Joint Force Headquarters in Massachusetts, Chief of Staff to Joint Force Headquarters, uh, and then 2011-2012 Commanding General U.S. Forces in Kabul. Uh, commanding General for Task Force Yankee and U all U.S. force operation, operating in the Kabul province, responsible for counterinsurgency operations, security, police mentoring, and humanitarian support, provided mission command as well as operational security and logistical support for 11 U.S. bases and installations, oversight for $800 million in contracting and construction, and a multinational force. Um, again, what the hell was I doing in 2011, 2012? I was kissing client ass and trying to figure out how to uh, do ads. The, so then from there, um, again, a lot of people could have sort of, uh, we talked about earlier the pattern of accomplishment um, and the pattern of alphas who don't just stop when they do one thing, right? So um, the general could have, kind of retired and just rested on his laurels at that point. Um, but as you'll see when you get to meet him a little bit, uh, it's not in his nature. So he came back and uh, led home base, um, looking out for the vets that he had led before. Um, and, you know, the suicide problem uh, was kind of this, the invisible wounds of war. Um, and so to come back and lead home base, and now try and help the people that he led um, from hurting themselves was just another layer of alpha, right? Um, and so, uh, and then, because that wasn't enough, uh, because why would you end your career there? Uh, not that he's ended his career at home base, uh, but then in the pandemic, um, when they needed to build a hospital, a stand-up hospital in the convention center, uh, who do you think they called to stand up the hospital? General Hammond. Uh, so there might be a pattern of leadership here that you're spotting. Uh, and I think the, um, 
it's just an honor, <laughs> and a teary honor, I apologize. <laughs> uh, but it, the, the, I haven't cried at a lot of LinkedIn profiles. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but uh, it's just so moving to kind of read that kind of leadership to me. Uh, it's an honor to be able to introduce you. And before the general gets up and speaks, we're going to uh, just go watch a home base video so that we kind of start with his most recent stuff and he'll talk all the way back. All right? Thank you, General. You know, most people, when they drive down the road and they see a car on the shoulder of the road, they don't think about it. But for us veterans, we drive down the road, we see that car, it takes you back to Fallujah. For example, me, it takes me back to the car that hit my truck and exploded and killed my Marines. Being in the Marine Corps was everything to me. It really was one of the best things I did. I had a sense of family that maybe I never had before. Uh, for the first time in my life, I had brothers. We lived together, we ate together, we worked together, we trained together, we suffered together. When your life is in somebody else's hands, it creates a bond that a lot of people can't really comprehend. The incident that kind of ended my career in the Marines took place on October 30th, 2004. We had just finished up a little operation and we were driving down the road and an SUV that was parked on the side of the road, when we passed by, it sped up and rammed us. And when it did, uh, he triggered an explosion. It was a suicide bomber and it was intentional. You know, when you hold somebody in your arms and they die, um, and you hear the sounds and you smell the smells. Unfortunately, that's stuff that will be a part of you. That's stuff that you'll take with you for the rest of your life. As a leader, my job was to protect my Marines. And for a very long time, I felt like a, a failure because I didn't, and I blamed myself. And I got really drunk and I got really high and I got really angry and pushed a lot of people out of my life. And I was having horrible thoughts, horrible nightmares. I didn't want to be alive. I didn't talk about it. I didn't speak about it. I wouldn't tell people I was in the Marines. So the mental scars are always there, almost like a little birdie tapping you on the shoulder to say, hey, don't forget about this. Don't forget about me. I'm still here. And things started to change when I noticed his temper became shorter. He was much more easily aggravated. Um, he began to isolate himself. It was bad. It, it, it was really bad. I put my wife through a lot of stuff, mental anguish that I wouldn't wish on anybody. I was afraid emotionally that my daughter would not be able to connect with her dad. And she loves Travis to pieces. And we had gotten to the point that I would pick her up from school and I would walk in first just to make sure he was OK, because I feared that at any moment I would come in and he'd be dead. So while they're deployed, veterans are making, you know, adaptations to a life and death scenario. Uh, and that makes perfect sense for that environment. But a lot of those ad adaptations don't really translate nicely to their lives back home. And can be very disruptive to relationships, to career, or to just their enjoyment of life in a civilian world back home. So if left untreated, PTSD can result in homelessness, unemployment, family relationships ending, total isolation from social relationships, hopelessness, and ultimately a sense of um, being a burden or being better off dead or even thinking about suicide or, or acting on those thoughts. Home Base Program is a private philanthropically funded clinic for veterans and their family members. It was founded through a partnership between Massachusetts General Hospital and the Red Sox Foundation. We treat veterans and their family regardless of their era of service or their ability to pay. And the staff at home base did such a wonderful job of making you feel at home. And I began to open up and I started sharing in the group and I started sharing with my, my therapist and started talking about some of the stuff that I never told anybody. And it got to a point where I actually looked forward to to setting down with my counselor. The way home base to take care of the whole family, it to me is a huge reason to support the group. 
because it wasn't just focused on my husband. Initially, they give him his week to focus on himself. Then they brought the spouse in, brought me in, and then we worked together. They gave her a voice for her to really be able to speak up and say, hey, you know, uh, I'm not the enemy. I'm here to help you. I'm standing beside you. So home base was a lifesaver. I can now think about playing with my daughter. I can want to be around the family. I can be present at birthday parties and not be an embarrassment or not be a, a shame to go out there. They saved one veteran and I'm that veteran. It's our, our duty as a nation to provide for the individuals who have sacrificed on our behalf. They've done their part and it's time for us to step up and help them and hold up our end of the bargain when they come home and they, and they need some support. There is no way we could have coordinated getting those medical professionals, all of that information together to help us address our situation specifically. And so the donations really help to save marriages, to save families, and to give hope. And I know he's taken such great steps to be where he is today. And I don't want to imagine life without him. It's a humbling feeling to know people care enough to change your life positively. When you think you're alone or by yourself, you're not. And for someone to care enough, there's nothing I can ever do to repay that. I can only simply tell them thank you. So thank you, and uh, first of all, thank you for that really generous and kind uh, introduction this morning. Um, you know, when I, when I look at Travis, um, I've met him personally, he's a great guy, I've met his wife. It, it just brings back a lot of memories and thoughts because he, he represents who, who we treat, why we do what we do every day at home base. And it is a unique partnership between the Red Sox and Mass General. Uh, and by the way, it was the Red Sox idea, strangely enough, and it was based on a visit they had down at Walter Reed Army Medical Center um, back in 2007. And it was after their World Series visit, uh, or the World Series in 2007, they, they went to the White House in 2008, and then they had a mission where they would go to Walter Reed and pass the trophies around, take pictures, sign autographs, and they were supposed to be there for an hour, and they stayed for five. And when they walked out of there, they, they were pretty substantially moved because it was the height of the surge in Iraq. We had the largest number of catastrophically injured young men and women um, ever. And when, when the Red Sox looked at these young kids, and a lot of them were kids, 18, 19, 20 years old, um, they wanted to do something and they put words to deeds. And when they came home, they met with Senator Ted Kennedy at the time who was on uh, the House Armed Services Committee and the Health and Services Committee. So he had a good vantage point of what was working and what wasn't. And when they asked for advice, they said, you need to partner with Mass General. They have the number one department of psychiatry in the country. They have Spalding Rehab, uh, the number one, two, or three physical rehab hospital in the country, uh, which would take care of the brain injury piece. And so they launched this incredible program back in 2009, and it was a small clinic in Boston um, and it treated roughly 200 folks a year with best care possible. But we had a significant limiting factor, and that limiting factor was traffic. Anybody could come to home base. We had gotten rid of all the barriers to care because we raised the money. We were 100% free to our veterans, military families, kids, and active duty service members. Did nothing like it in the country. It was the first private sector endeavor like this. And, and so, over the next few years, we tried to figure out how do we reimagine what's possible in the field of veteran medicine? How do we reach a much larger audience? And it's funny, and I'm, I'm kind of leading at the back end, I'll come back to the, the beginning of the story, but it takes you to what's possible when you bring all these different tools together, which is what we were able to do. Um, we looked at partnering and building a hub and spoke model. We were the hub and we'd have satellite clinics all around New England. Uh, but nobody would take us up on it because of the cost. Uh, to run a small clinic for 200 people costs roughly $3 million a year. And since it's, you have to raise that $3 million every year, it's a fairly substantial amount of money. Uh, nobody wanted to take us up on it in Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, any of them. 
And so then we took another look and we said, well, we'll build up and we'll become a center of excellence, much like Mass General does, where people from all over the world come here for the highest level of care. And then we'll work later on with other folks to build local capacity and train people to do better where they are. Um, so the first thing we had to do is figure out what, what would be the mechanism device to do that. And we identified and built a 14-day intensive clinical program that compresses two years of therapy into 14 days. Now, when you think about that on the surface, you're like, how is that even possible? It is. Because if you just do the math on it, most people go to therapy once a week for an hour. If somebody does group therapy, they go once a week for an hour. So what these folks do is they come for 50 sessions of group therapy, 50 weeks. They come for 15 sessions of individual therapy. They do a six-week mind-body medicine program that's compressed into that 14 days. Working with our friends from the Red Sox strength and conditioning team, we, we uh, grew a series of team members uh, who, treat, who teach a fitness, nutrition, and wellness-based program so that they learn to eat better because anybody knows anybody suffering from any form of depression, a lot of times they retract, they eat garbage, they get heavier, then their self-esteem goes down the tubes, they drink more, there's so many things. So we wanna get their mind, body, and soul kind of right during that 14-day period, but as you can imagine, wipes them out when they're there. Um, really does a number on them because it's so hard and demanding. And they're talking about things they never wanted to talk about again. They're talking about the worst day of their life in many cases. And who wants to keep bringing that up? And so through this program and, and by creating this mechanism, by the way, everybody at Mass General told me it couldn't be done. It'd be too expensive, nobody would come, and it'd be too hard to do. And, and, and as John pointed out, that and my wife will verify, when somebody tells me no, that's a battle cry. Now I gotta prove you wrong. Um, and we did it. And, and the other day, I think we've been doing this now for five years, we, we found uh, three other academic medical centers that partnered with us at UCLA, Emory University in Atlanta, Rush Medical in Chicago. Um, the sum total of those three programs equals the one at Mass General. Uh, every two weeks, 24 veterans are flown into Boston at no cost to them, we cover that. They stay at the Marriott Tudor Wharf in Charlestown. Um, and they do this 14-day program all at no cost to them. Again, it's supported by the, the, uh, the, the care and love of a grateful nation, uh, supporting the care they need uh, when they return home from war. Um, program is amazing. Um, we've had thousands of people come through it. And when I tell you they go from non-functioning to functioning in two weeks, it's a transformation like any you've never seen. These are the folks that are part of that 20-a-day suicides that we still encounter. And, and, and when you look at the need of what we're working on, it's staggering. So in 20 years of war, we had three million young men and women volunteer to step into harm's way and go to Iraq and Afghanistan on our collective behalf to prevent a second 9-11 attack and to hold those who did the first one and were planning to hurt us accountable. And we did it, and we left last summer and after 20 years. But, the, but it comes as a price tag, and they have an expression, freedom isn't free. Out of those young people, we lost 7,070 were killed in action, um, but 30,000 of that same cohort group died by suicide during that period. 7,000 to combat, 30,000 to suicide. Remarkable. 1.8 million of them are permanently injured in some way or another, and, and the big chunk of that is the mental health and brain injuries, the unseen or invisible wounds of war. And that's why Home Base was created, um, but through a, the course of our, our, our 10 year history, we keep looking for those gaps or seams in what's available and we reimagine what's possible. Uh, three years ago, just before the um, pandemic, uh, the medical leadership of SEAL Team 6 came up to us and asked us to develop a brain injury program uh, for their SEALs. Uh, and we agreed to pilot with them for 15 people and that 15 actually turned into 70 because they can't, you know, T they can't not tell two friends when something good happens, and they tell two friends, and suddenly it went to 15 to 70, and we, we have a hard time saying no, and we did it. Um, since that time, 200 special operations team members have come to home base for this really magnificent, um, comprehensive brain health and treatment program. Uh, and these are Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Delta Force members, Army Rangers. Um, and the men, the men involved with this, these programs, these special operations teams, on average, had 15 to 20 combat deployments, 5,000 parachute jumps. And when you fall out of an airplane, 
Um, it's not really skydiving. You're falling out of an airplane with hundreds of pounds of equipment and you bounce pretty good and you don't always land on your feet. So there's a lot of um, uh, traumatic brain injuries that take place because you get concussions. Uh, and so through these programs, each step of the way, we find new ways to help people and, and deliver medicine in this 21st century, just like you all do with your business. Um, the latest program we're doing now is we're working in local communities to build capacity where there is none. We started in Southwest Florida in Fort Myers because that's where JetBlue Park is and we had a foothold there to begin with. And, and then from there, um, we, we started working along the whole Southwest Florida five county region. And what we did was we started with a wellness program that we initially created in Boston and we used Florida as our incubator. We tried it and we said, if we can do an extramural program a thousand miles away from the Mass General Campus, we can do this anywhere. And so we did, we built that up. Um, and we had the strength and conditioning fitness wellness program. Uh, we had a hundred folks from Southwest Florida come up to that two week program, but we went to hand them back to local care. There was no one to hand them off to. And that became frustrating because we did all this fantastic work. We got these folks to a great place, but they needed maintenance care and there was no one to give them to. So we had another problem. We required a new solution. What we decided to do was we'd find the number one healthcare system in the Southwest Florida region. And they also had a behavioral health clinic. We said, we will take five-year clinicians, bring them to Boston, certify them in trauma therapy. And then when they go back down there through local fundraising, we'll purchase 50% of their salaries so that 20 hours a week, they can deliver cost of care to veterans at no cost. With the other 20 hours a week, you will have somebody that can treat trauma-related injury in your community at you know, whatever cost you charge. Uh, so they created, they had a capability that nobody else had in Southwest Florida, trauma trained mental health professionals. And as you know, car wrecks, assaults, rapes, you name it, require trauma therapy, not just general practitioner therapy. And so people in Florida weren't getting that care. We were able to deliver that. Within six months over in Naples, no one likes to be outdone, Collier County said we want it. And the David Lawrence Center asked us to do the same thing there. Um, Last week, the state of Florida has offered, is going to provide us with a million dollars to look at doing that in other communities across Florida because all we do is train people, build the capacity, have um, bilateral referrals, and then we kind of have consultative assistance once this is on the ground. And, and so from there, these things start to juggernaut, just like all the rest of our work did. You know, we went from seeing 200 people a week, a, a year rather, to 2,000 people a year in our latest transformation. And so through this latest mechanism, we're now working with the state of Arizona and the tribal leadership of Navajo, Hopi, and Apache Nation. Um, that's not even off the ground yet. And last week we got a call from Lakota Nation and Cherokee Nation. So I think our new, our new uh, niche is gonna be taking care of the tribal lands and the veterans that live in those. And in a sad state of affairs because it, it is abject poverty on those, those areas. Navajo Nation is the size of New England. Um, and it has three community hospitals. So you can imagine, you know, anyone that's driven to New York, you don't get all the way to New York, but if, you know, that landmass, if there were only three Winchester hospitals to cover the whole place, that's not a lot. Um, so that's what home base does, and it's remarkable, but we've been able to summon all of the resources and use all of the agility, adaptability, flexibility, even through the pandemic, coming up all of these things, I mean, as John mentioned, we had to build a field hospital in the middle of that. Um, but we have a great team, and that's what it really comes back to. And I'm going to hit those points separately. Um, if I could go to my next slide. There we go. Um, and so I've got an interesting turn of events. When, when Maura reached out to me, she asked me for the title of the presentation. Um, I gave her that one, and it's Crave the Impossible. And I felt pretty good about it. And, and, and that's the problem sometimes when you're in a leadership position, you can impress yourself quite easily. <laughs> but there's always a good critic, and my primary critic in life is my wife, Colleen. Uh, we met as Army officers, and when we met, uh, we were both lieutenants, uh, she was a public affairs officer, which is the Army's version of public relations. And so she's since become, over the past three decades, my personal public relations team. Uh, and she's critical. And so she said, oh, what did you call that presentation? And I told her, and she went, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I thought it sounded pretty good. And she said, what was your second thought? 
And so I had a second thought and it was reimagine what's possible. So what she's asked me to do today is reach out to your imp impressive and incredible um, advertising and marketing skills and by a show of hands, I wanna just get a sense of which sounds better and then I just wanna ask quickly a couple reasons why but, but, but raise a hands for the first one for Crave the Impossible. Okay. And then how about reimagine what's possible? <laughs> all right, so I, I didn't get crushed. That was all I was hoping for today. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, she did. Well, my son's here. She sent him to make sure <laughs> I didn't lie. Um, and, and what's interesting is in either case, that, that's kind of where we're going in this new uh, post-pandemic world. And, and it, you know, as I've been looking towards the future, if you just take a minute and read this, I, I threw this thing together um, because frankly, it, it kind of captured where we are in the world today. And it talks about the fact that we live in a world that's exploding with innovation and technological growth. We operate at the speed of thought, communicate at the speed of light. Our global communications continue to evolve at a speed, really a decade ago it was inconceivable that we would be doing the things we do today. Um, and it's not a pandemic, it's now an endemic period. It's a next normal, it's not a new normal. And this instability will require every organization that wishes to succeed to operate at the speed of relevance. And I have a lot to talk about with that because I lived that life overseas. Um, you need to constantly reinvent yourself or you're gonna get left by the wayside. And, and that is a fact that, that, that is now our reality. But the challenge with this is you require a bold new leadership that we don't have prevalent in, America, in corporate America today. And there are studies after studies by CEOs talking about that fact. And it's a, really for a very simple reason we don't have a mechanism to train leaders. Medical schools train doctors, engineer schools train engineers, BU trains marketing students. That's where I went. Uh, but the Army trains leaders. Leaders are our lifeblood. We can't do anything about it and we train thousands and thousands and thousands of new people every year. So we get about 40,000 new officers from across the country, from ROTC, Officer Candidate School, West Point, but at the same time, we have all these young soldiers going from specialist to corporal, now they're a non-commissioned officer, corporal to sergeant, sergeant to staff sergeant, and there's leader development programs to take them every step of the way, and it includes three critical elements, and it's training, experience, and mentorship. And we take it serious because if we don't do that, we will look like the Russian army, and we all see how poorly they're doing. The Russian army does not have a non-commissioned officer school or what we call in the army sergeants. They don't exist. They have officers and privates. And when they knock off the generals, those officers, they don't have anybody leading them and they just bumble and stumble because nobody wants to stick their neck out and get in trouble. We have a very definitive chain of command full of young people. And I will tell you, those young people are just remarkable. I, I had so many young guys overseas and gals that were high school degrees and they were responsible for life and death decisions for their teammates. And in addition to that, they're responsible for their well-being and their family's well-being. 21-year-old kid, 19-year-old kid. And then as you get older, there's just more people you're responsible for, and it's ingrained in them that they do these things. There is no, there is no replicable version of that in, in, in American academic world. Um, if you go to Harvard Business School, you might get one class on leadership during a two-year program, and I'm telling you, three hours a week for a couple of weeks isn't going to replicate what we do. Um, and so we're able to build leaders, and that's what we do. And so what I'm hoping to do today is just kind of talk about some of the lessons I've learned over this time um, and share those with you so that um, you can kind of make some assessments on how you want to approach it, because you certainly aren't going to join the Army and spend six years and then come back here to Boathouse. Um, but the problem is if people don't try and self-improve in these areas and do a little professional reading and try and learn some of these things, um, you can't catch up. And the end result is we've got a generation of young people that are leaving their jobs right now uh, because they're coming out of the pandemic and then suddenly people are saying you gotta come to work. That's a big bummer for some folks that some kids never even started. They never had a place to work. They came in during the pandemic and worked remote. And then there's a lot of other people at the mid-career that are saying, I want to change. 
And so if, if it's not a, an empowering environment, it's not a place where you feel like you're being taken care of, where you have opportunities, all these different things that we look at, and I know that's why you're here today. You're, you're trying to work on these skills. That's how people, that's how you retain top talent. Um, certainly money will, money will work, but that's a mercenary approach, which only keeps someone as long as someone will pay them more. You want to build teams, and, and that's why you, that's how you succeed. Um, so as we look at this, we're going to have global disorder and instability for, for a, quite, a, quite, a, quite a while moving forward. And, and when we look back, there's something called the fourth industrial period that began actually very quietly a couple of years ago. And we all know about the different industrial revolutions. The latest one actually be, began a few years ago. I think it's four or five years ago. But it was very quiet and subtle. And you started hearing about the Internet of Things and all these different things that were being quietly slipped into our life that were changing our lives and changing the way we were doing business. But it really wasn't until, and we all know 9-11, transformational changes took place after that. Um, the pandemic in 2020 really brought a lot of this to light because it derailed supply chains. It changed entire business structures. Everybody went remote. Telehealth became a new thing that it wasn't. And it changed every aspect of our lives. And there is no going back. There's only going forward. There'll be some type of hybrid version moving forward. But we won't go back to 2019, and you can't. Um, change is there. And so as we, as we look towards the future, you have to figure out how do you leverage that? How do you see the opportunities and challenges on the front end of it, not on the back end as it goes by? Because then you're a bystander. Uh, and then there's those that just ignore it. And there's a number of reasons people ignore it. And you've heard people say, we're going right back to the way we were doing business. That's, that's the ostrich sticking his head in the sand, and we know what happens then. Um, never works out well. So what, what I've put together for this discussion is what I call five pretty good rules for leadership. Uh, there are a million books on leadership, and everybody espouses to be an expert. Um, I cringe when I hear that word, because as soon as you say that, someone's going to embarrass you. Someone's going to prove one of the things you just said was wrong. And so I'm just going to stick with the pretty good rules for leadership. Take them for what you want. So the first one is, in, the, in this fourth industrial, right, 21st century, you have to operate at the speed of relevance, right? If you're not relevant, they're rolling right by you. And, and if you look at some of the legacy organizations that are trying to cling to the past, they never make it. And there's, there's so many great examples. The best one I always like is Blockbuster. How many people remember Blockbuster? How many people know Netflix approached Blockbuster and asked to partner with them? And they threw them out. That's a stinger. <laughs> How many people remember Polaroid cameras? How many people know that they invented, invented digital photography and said, nah? We have such a great business with film, why would we introduce that? Because it would cannibalize our other business. Where are they today? And they were powerhouse. And, and so when you look at those easy examples of powerhouses that owned it, I mean, there was, an, there was a blockbuster on every block in every town, and they're gone. They, they just vanished overnight. Um, and so as you look at that, you've got to operate at the speed of relevance. The next one is you've got to set the conditions for success. It doesn't just happen. You've got to work on your skills. You've got to know what you're doing. Um, one of the things I always talk about is the fact that you've got to understand fear. Because one of the top, top, top things that stop people from reimagining what's possible, moving forward into a new direction, is fear. And it's fear of uncertainty. It's fear of the unknown. That's principally what it is. And for most people, um, that fear triggers something way back in your lizard brain that causes you to say, no, I don't want to do it. It's too scary. I like what we're doing. This is safe. This is working. Let's stick with what we do. And I've run into it my whole career. And I'll share a quick story on that in a moment. But that is something that's real. And so that's one group of people that'll stop you. Then there's a whole other crew of miscreants that will try and stop you because they just want to stop you. They don't, it wasn't their idea. It doesn't fit their narrative. Um, they want to go in a different direction. They're not even looking at whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but it's not going to help them in their career, so they're going to stop it. And they're, they're the worst. I, I have more empathy for the folks that are just afraid, because you can work them through it. 
when you find these miscreants, you gotta just work around them and try and get rid of them when you have a chance. Um, and I've done that in my, my, my professional career and that, that really is one of those good moments. Because you know how much they've cost the organization and they've hurt people professionally. So when you can put a bullet in a miscreant, that's always a good day, <laughs> figuratively speaking. <laughs> Um, the next bullet, a lot about leadership, becoming an expeditionary leader. And, and, and so that's something I thought I knew a lot about leadership before I went to Iraq. I was at the 18 year mark of my career. I had gone through all sorts of leadership training, officer candidate school, my officer basic courses, my advanced courses, all this training. I had a lot of experience as a platoon leader, a company commander, a battalion uh, operations officer, all the right assignments. I even went to Boston University for three years and taught leadership and ethical decision making. So I'm feeling pretty hot stuff. I got my stuff together and in, in, in 2001, I was given command of a, a battalion of roughly 1,000 soldiers. And it was still peacetime because it was February 2001. And as we know, by that late summer, the world changed. Saddam crossed into uh, Kuwait. Uh, I'm sorry, 9-11, um, on September 11th, we were hit. Um, and, and the world changed forever. And so I had to suddenly up my game. I mean, we were, now we were in a wartime footing. I had had some small deployments, non-combat related, but this is now the real thing. And, and, you've got, and now you've got a thousand people you're responsible for. And really that's the weight you're carrying and it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, and, and so as we shipped overseas, um, change after change after change. So on 9-11, I got orders to immediately deploy my battalion uh, to all these critical locations in the U.S. to secure them. And it was everything from a nuclear power plant to a water reservoir, to bridges, to military installations. And we did that for two weeks. And then they stood us down because we were part of a rapid deployment package to potentially go to Afghanistan. And we were, we were down for maybe five days and then it, you may remember the news when President Bush ordered the military in to secure our airports. And so my, my soldiers were ordered to uh, go in and secure seven U.S. airports to include Logan Airport. And that was a pretty remarkable thing. And we did that for the next seven months. And as that was wrapping down, I received orders to deploy the battalion to Afghanistan as part of the second rotation in. Um, and it was a pretty incredible assignment. We were going to have some of our tropes, troops in uh, Kanish Kanabad, Uzbekistan. We'd have one military police company. We had another one that was going to be in Kabul. Another one was going to be in Kandahar. Um, one that was going to have split to Jacobabad, Pakistan. So we were all over the place and I'm trying to get my head around all the things I'm supposed to do. And in the middle of it, they had change after change after change. And then my headquarters ended up splitting between Fort Drum, a mission there, and then another mission over in Afghanistan. Um, so as that six month mission ended and we were getting close to wrapping up, I got orders that the invasion for Iraq was on and I needed to leave Afghanistan, go to Fort Hood and prepare for that mission. Um, so has anyone ever been on a business trip and they've had to call home and tell their spouse they're going to be late by a day? How'd you like to call and say at the end of six months, it's going to be another six months? I would rather go back to Fallujah than make that call. <laughs> And so I, I told my wife what was going on and she said, okay, great. Um, and so we, we prepared for that mission. And, and the mission we were assigned, we were gonna be attached to the 4th Infantry Division and we were told that we were gonna come in through Turkey and then come down from the north into Iraq as part of a northern invasion route. And the rest of the units would hit Kuwait and then come up from the south and we'd all converge on Baghdad. We loaded up all our ships, we got planned, we, went, we did a big digital warfighter exercise, full roll, um, went through the, we fought the whole war in, in a week, digitally, because they advanced it very quickly. We found the loopholes, made the corrections, everything got ready. And then we found out um, President Bush's undersecretary, a guy by the name of Paul Wolfowitz, who is a class A, a meathead, <laughs> did not have the Turks' permission yet. Seems to me, one of the top things you'd get. <laughs> they said no. Hell no. So now we had an infantry division of 15,000 troops with hundreds of tanks, planes, helicopters, sitting off the coast of Turkey on the eve of the invasion. I swear to God, you can't make this up. 
something happened in, Af in, in Iraq and they said, we need all these units back over there. They launched me to Kuwait as we get ready for the invasion. And my stuff's still sitting off the coast of Turkey, all my equipment. So all I have was the people. And so we get over there and we started working our stuff. The war, ground war started. Um, if you ever go to a war, if anyone saw the movie Braveheart, the commanding general for Fifth Corps was General William Wallace. That was encouraging. But one day, General Wallace uh, hit me up at one of the staff meetings and said, why are you still here? <laughs> and I said, my equipment's not here. And he goes, sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> you need to get going. And my units had their stuff, but my headquarters didn't. So we had to commandeer some vehicles, acquire some radios, build some stuff, and off we went the next day into Iraq. Um, so now I'm in a whole new mission. They told me I was originally going into Baghdad to help fight with the uh, 18th MP Brigade. Uh, and Baghdad's a city of four million people, and you know, suddenly there's lawlessness. Once they took it, now they gotta keep it and protect people and, and do a lot of good things. Um, but just as I went to launch on that, they said, nope, new plan, you're not going there. You're going up to Balad. And, and that later was described as the center of the Sunni Triangle. Um, they said it was a permissive environment, we just need you to get up there and kind of stabilize things and secure it. It was anything but stable, it was anything but secure. And as we cruised up there in our bus that we acquired, with my units, I'm feeling less than proud of myself and everything else because I, I picture myself rolling into battle in my armored Humvee and all the rest of it and I'm commuting in a bus. Um, so we get there and it was anything but permissive. Um, the place was under attack every day. The base we were securing in the region would eventually house 35,000 troops. We were the first 200. And you can imagine something the size of um, Charlestown um, with no fence around it and bad guys everywhere in the heart of the Sunni Triangle. So we were under attack almost every day. We got 25 mortar rounds, rockets in every night, um, and we had to build some security as they built this out as the core logistical center where all the stuff in the world would come in. And, and as we move forward, I'm imagining myself, things are gonna get better. Um, no sooner than I get things ready and we're moving, um, they split my headquarters and sent me to Fallujah, and so I had, I had to form a second battalion, and, and, and things got crazy, but my point behind all that is, every time we had a plan, it changed. It was, we, we were operating and working and living in an unstable environment, a highly chaotic environment, a pretty dangerous environment, um, but we still had to do our jobs. And so though all of those things become conditions of operation. You still have your core mission, how you do it though, adjust based on the conditions you're operating in. In this 21st century, we all have to figure out how we're gonna operate. I talk about with the right people and the right stuff, you can accomplish anything. And that's what I figured out. Um, because my equipment wasn't there, I had an 80 man, 80 person headquarters. I couldn't take everybody because we had 25 vehicles coming in and you need two people per vehicle to drive 12 hours from Kuwait up to Iraq. So I could only take 10 good people. And with 10 good people, I ran a battalion for of 800 people um, for about two months. And I was able to do it because we picked the right 10 people. And as you all know, I'd rather have 10 good people than 30 mediocre. Or, you know, you, because they, a lot of the mediocre folks that don't want to pull their weight, that don't want to do their job, cause distractions and problems, and they slow you down. So I'd rather be lean and have the right people. And then you gotta give them the right stuff, the right resources. Um, but in a pinch, even without the right stuff, if you have the right people, they can still figure it out. And then we get back to crave the impossible or reimagine what's possible. You gotta think big. I always say go big or go home. If you, if you shoot for the stars and you end up short, you still made it to the moon. In the army, they have an expression when we, we treat, treat, teach marksmanship, if you aim low, you hit low. So if you aim low, you always hit low. If you aim high, you're gonna hit high. So as you operate at the speed of relevance, uh, and that's, these are just some pictures from Fallujah in 2003. How do we get over that? I think I'm on target now. My slides are all ate up right now. Uh, 
I apologize. I'm at the closing thoughts already, so <laughs> talk's over. This is where my aide would take away the clicker. There we go. So when you operate at the speed of relevance, there is a need for speed. If you, if you wait, you hesitate, the moment passed. You have a window of opportunity in, a, in an instable, chaotic environment. In, in normal, traditional times, that window's much wider and you can think a little bit more methodically. But nowadays, when there's an opportunity, you have to seize the moment. And, and you don't want to be reckless about it, so you need certain tools to be able to see that, um, see beyond the horizon as we talk about it. Uh, the other thing we've learned was that you had to adapt or die. And in the hostile environment we lived in, every day was an adventure. And every day we get up, you know, at night we went to bed and we planned out that mission, knowing that there was another group of people planning to do the exact opposite and hurt us. And so we just had to be a little smarter than them, and it was really a Darwinian um, environment of, you know, you either, you either do your job and, and do it well, if they do it better, it's game over for you. And so it's not that extreme here, but I would tell you in, in the business world, those that don't act, don't act quickly, they're gonna be left behind. Those that do act, that see the opportunity or the threat, and they mitigate the threat or they seize the opportunity, they're gonna succeed. When we talk about setting the conditions for success, um, that's an important part. If you don't like the construct, the operating environment you're in, don't accept it. Find a way to change it. You know, I talked to, um, I mean, I used to talk with my students. Um, if you have to go give a presentation, and somehow the room's not set up the way you like it, go there early and move it. You know, if you're, the, if you're supposed to be delivering the class or teaching it and it's not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to do a good job, don't accept the way it is, try and make a change and fix it. Uh, a few years back, I, I went on an advanced mission to Afghanistan and I knew I was gonna be the commanding general for Kabul province for a year. And they send you over there about four months before you go there to walk the ground. You already have your plan ready and you go, you go really walk the ground, look at everything and validate your planning. When I got there, what I saw was, uh, scared me because they did not have security in mind at all. They were treating it as an administrative environment and, and based on the work I did in Iraq and Afghanistan previously, I, I was worried because it, it, there were 10 bases we were responsible for, the threat level was off the chart and, and the guy I was replacing w had an inward focus as he described it and not an external focus. Um, and he, he tried to say that the Turkish Brigade will take care of that. Um, the challenge with the Turkish Brigade was that they had 8,000 troops in Afghanistan for 15, 18 years and never lost a soldier in combat. They weren't that good. The safest place for a ship is the harbor, but that's not why we have ships. They stayed on the bases, and so they weren't gonna be of any help. And so I spent the next two weeks in Afghanistan trying to find the right person to talk to, to tell them this is insane, we need to do something. Um, while I went through the motions and tried to meet with all the people I had to meet with, and on the last night I was there, I got a call on a cell phone from the chief of operations uh, for the um, um, US forces Afghanistan, a guy named General Mike Linnington. And Mike's a tremendous guy and he said, hey, I just saw your plan, I I'd like to talk to you about it. And I said. Well, I've been here two weeks and I'm flying out tomorrow. He goes, oh, well, come see me tonight. And I said, yeah, so I don't have a car. <laughs> and the guy I'm with won't let me out. He goes, I'll send my car for you. So at six o'clock at night, he, had a, he sent a security team over for me and my operations officer and my XO. We briefed him the plan. And at the end of it, he said, this is exactly what we wanted. We've been seeing the same thing. We can't get the guy you're replacing to do anything. We really want to do this. And he said, can you make this into slides? And I said, this is all I got. <laughs> He goes, oh, you can use my desk, you can use my stuff. All right, great. Built some slides, six slides. He said, can you brief uh, General Rodriguez, who was the General Petraeus, he replaced General Petraeus. So he was the four-star commander of everything. And I said, sure, when do you want to do that? He goes, well, now. Sure. 
So I briefed General Rodriguez, loved the idea. He said, as soon as you come back, I want you to implement this new security plan that'll focus on securing all the bases and all the convoy routes and all this other good stuff. Great. And I said, hey, by the way, I have a boss that's in between you guys that I haven't spoken with yet. And he's not going to be pleased that I jumped him and went to the top guy in Afghanistan. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll take care of that. They didn't. <laughs> I landed in Qatar. My phone was blowing up. Everybody in the world wanted to kill me. I didn't care, though, because right is right. And when we came back, it took several months to do what we had hoped to do. And I'll show you the outcomes and why it was important in a moment. But the key was we did not accept the status quo. We did not accept the construct because it, I, it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, and it would be on me if I allowed it to continue. Um, you've got to learn to manage fear. Fear is that thing that there are a million reasons why people have fear. Um, there's ways to get around it. For those that, it, dealing with uncertainty, you need intelligence. We, in the Army, we call it intelligence. You can call it information in the private sector. There's so much information out there in open source on every business because everybody does press releases. So you know what your competition's doing because they tell you, they brag about it. The other part is you got to manage that with situational awareness. And that was a valuable lesson I learned in Iraq. I used to get these amazing intelligence briefings on all these things, like we would have a target, they were going to have all these weapon stuff, and I'd get there and it was a toilet, it was an outdoor commode and we had all these guys looking foolish. And so after that, we worked our human intelligence sources, spies, and we built a, an incredible network of spies. And that took a lot of work, and I had to divert resources to get the intelligence I needed. But once I had it, we were executing a, a different raid every day, um, capturing tons and tons of explosives, uh, weapons, mortars, rockets, you name it. That otherwise they'd be shooting at us. So, I mean, we had a vested interest in this. But it was the investment in intelligence collection that allows you to make informed decisions. If you have an informed decision and a process to make decisions, it takes the scariness out of it because it's a vetted decision. You always have to lean forward a little bit, but you, you get rid of a lot of the uncertainty. So that, that's part of setting the conditions for success. And then as you, as you build out your operations, you have to continue that because you want to see when the trends change. Going back to my idea, I thought it was a great idea for my title until I got an eh for my wife. You got to vet things out, but you constantly got to look at it. And so I may go with reimagine the possi uh, what's possible next time because it was kind of good and I like it too. It's not horrible and I don't have to be embarrassed again by her. Um, and so when we went into Afghanistan that last time in 11 and 12, as you can see, look at the vastness of that landscape. That's just a small picture out a window. We could never control Afghanistan. There's not enough troops we could pour into it. And that's the problem that you're going to see the Russians face in the Ukraine. When you look at those little red specks on the map of Ukraine at night when the news comes on, that's all, that's the 200,000 troops are in there. Look at all the blank spot. How do you cover all that? You need almost 10 times the number it takes to take over a country to control it. And that's why we never really wanted to control Iraq or Afghanistan. We wanted them to take ownership. It's just they never, it never clicked for them to do that. In the Ukraine, I would not want to be the Russians. There's 40 million people that are upset. There's little old ladies handing soldiers sunflower seeds and say, hey, put these in your pockets so when you die, we'll know where you were. And then filling Molotov cocktails. 40 million people are coming at you. You're, you're in the wrong environment and, and they're going to pay a price for that. But as you can see from this, you know, that top, the guy in the top right corner fought with the Mujahideen against the Russians. He had a village out in uh, Northwest Kabul um, with, that we were building schools because what we looked at was, and, and the lesson I learned is, you can't kill your way out of this thing. You can't go around trying to shoot people to solve this problem. You've got you've to build um, a society in a sense. And by that I mean educate the kids. That's the first step. So they can read the Koran and they can make their own determination because the literacy rate was like 5%. So all you, all you have to do is depend on somebody telling you what the Koran says and then you've got to do it. Raise the literacy rate give opportunities, people start thriving, they're going to want to not blow things up, they're going to want to keep things going. So we had a mission to do that. Um, I had to explain to him that that's what I wanted to do, there were no strings attached. Because the only string was, you're going to have smarter people, and they'll make, they'll make better decisions, and I won't have to come back. Um, down in the lower picture is one of my uh, commanders. I had a Mongolian uh, infantry battalion that was assigned to me. I also had Georgians, Albanians, and Afghans. So it was a really comprehensive uh, organization, and every one of them is culturally different, they are equipped and resource different, and they have different skills. And as you grow in your leadership, you have to figure out how to manage shortfalls and exploit strengths. So get the most out of people. 
And one of the strongest rules I'll always talk about with leadership is you want to um, help people maximize their potential. Because if you can find that good team and you can help them maximize their potential, all you have to do is provide them purpose, direction, and resources and turn them loose. So I thought we had everything set. We got security set up. We invested um, eight hour, three eight hour shifts a day to build an operations intelligence fusion cell so we could manage a crisis if it occurred. Five days after it was completed, there was an explosion. Um, there was an attack on the U.S. Embassy that lasted 18 hours. Most Americans don't even remember it or heard of it, which is remarkable to me. You know, a U.S. Embassy under attack for 18 hours straight. Um, if you see that building on the left, um, that was, an, that was a half-built structure in the Massoud Circle, but when you're up on top of it, you look down, and you can see that little map, the Presidential Palace, you can see the U.S. Embassy, uh, ISAF NATO headquarters, and from that position, they were shooting down into all those places and kept them under attack. Um, I, had, I had gone to a police graduation that morning, um, and it was the first female police officer graduating from their police academy, and I wanted to be there to congratulate her. As I was leaving, um, we were traveling down the road past the parliament building in the national headquarters, and we were stopped at a checkpoint, and they were trying to tell us we couldn't go. We didn't have an interpreter, um, and I didn't understand what he was saying. And we said, well, I, I've got to get back to my base. Right then, my phone blew up, and I had a burner phone, and a lot of guys have burner phones overseas to talk home. Uh, back in 2002 and three, no such thing. Three-month mail, three months back. Burner phone, instant. And, and, and after all these deployments, my wife found peace if I could text her at the morning and at night that I was okay. And then if something happened, she'd text me. I had eight different tests, text saying, are you okay, are you okay, what's going on? And so I, I texted her back, I said, what's happening? She said, your city's under attack. <laughs> now I'm the commanding general of Kabul province. There's a mini Tet Offensive going on across the city, and my wife's telling me. Once again, that's why I listen to her. <laughs> CNN, instant news, we talk about that, um, had already had that on the, up on the you know, Associated Press, CNN were already showing live feed. Um, when we travel across the city, we had a system that would kill all cell coverage around us so they couldn't ignite roadside bombs. So as we travel through a, a city of four million people and you're going down the main boulevard, you see people looking at their phone because we just buy and killed everything. So that, my, my phone didn't work either. And so as soon as we stopped, the radio started chattering and, and my radio blew up and we knew what was going on. The city was under attack. We got to the Massoud Circle and there was nobody there. And, and to picture the Massoud Circle, it's a giant rotary in the middle, in the heart of Kabul, and people travel multi-directions randomly. There are donkey carts going the wrong way around the circle because it's easier. There are people with Toyota pickups with horses in the back standing up and somebody sitting in the saddle. It's stuff you can't believe, but it's a chaotic flowing mess every day. There was nobody there. Now that was a lesson I had learned in Iraq. If it's quiet, it's dangerous. In places, it's not supposed to be quiet. And we saw a few guys that were on the ground that weren't breathing anymore, and we stopped, we checked them out. Uh, and we were about to move on that building when my command sergeant major, um, Bill Davidson, looked over and he said, look over to your right, and there was a platoon of Afghans approaching, and they were in a combat formation. Um, and, and they're not really good. And, and so you don't want to be anywhere in front of them when they're moving, because it's pretty easy for someone to get trigger happy and have them shoot me instead of help me. Um, so I got back and did my job as a general and go back and manage the operation. Um, but 18 hours, this thing took place in the heart of the city. And, and talk about a crisis. We had, man we had managed all these different things and keep moving forward. Um, a few weeks later, and the problem got worse. Like you can see that these, these were the headlines that my wife was seeing on the news back then. Um, you know, Kabul under attack. And as you can see, it was a pretty pitch fight. And, and my job was to work with the Afghan security to help put them in front and have them lead it and, and, and be able to solve this problem. But it, it only, we can only let it go on so long and eventually we had to step in and help them out a little bit. And the guys in the top right corner, uh, there were some Norwegian special forces and British special forces that we integrated with them so they could still get the victory, but they had a little help. Um, and they were bringing it to a successful conclusion. I was happy to find out from the special operators that they had all the doors and windows wired with explosives. So if I hadn't listened to my good friend, Sergeant Major Bill Davidson, and we went running in there like the cavalry, 
it would have been a short-lived experience when I opened the door. Um, so good lesson learned there. Three weeks later, October 29th, mass casualty attack. Uh, we lost 17 soldiers that day. A suicide bomb truck drove into the side of an armored vehicle, uh, instantly killing our 17 troops. Um, also, along with, as that wreckage, you can see the wreckage there, when it came down, uh, several Afghan children were killed, a couple Afghan people, and we had our behavioral health dog. Um, I just finished my command and staff meeting. My aide came in and announced that there had been a mass casualty event, and it was one of those situations where there was no book for this. There is no doctrine for that. And so I gave some initial instructions to my staff to get as much information as they could, find all the resources that we had at our disposals, because we would have to recover the remains, we would have to medevac anybody injured, we would also have to recover a 30-ton hulk in the heart of one of the busiest cities in the, in the world. And we had none of that equipment, so we had to figure all that out. I told them to meet me in the office for five minutes. I went back to my, uh, my own office, closed the door, sat down and went, crap, I don't know what to do. <laughs> this is not something in the playbook. There's no plan for this. Um, and so I just sat there for a minute, closed my eyes, took a couple deep breaths, and had to be called a leadership moment where you just kind of get all the thoughts out and then, you know, get all the nervousness out, all the self-doubt out, because we all have self-doubt, especially when we go to take on something monumentally big, scary, and important. Um, but this is a case where in three thoughts and sketch looking for me to tell them what to do. And so I had to take that three minutes and just gather my thoughts and sketch a framework for ideas. And then I shook it off, got up, opened the door, brought it in, and we got to work. And it was pretty remarkable because we had to get cranes in from somewhere to move that hulk because we had to remove this as a visual symbol of the Taliban's ability to, to degrade the government in the capital right in front of parliament. Um, it was a visual reminder. We had to get it out of there. We had to recover. There were no survivors. We had to recover the remains of 17 folks, some of them intermingled. What a, what a gruesome, horrible job. And that's one of the reasons why we have such an important job for home base. They weren't trained for that. These are 17, think of your kids and friends of 17, 18 years old. Suddenly they've got to go into a mass casualty event that they're not trained and prepared for and, and pick up pieces and parts of people. Um, horrible, horrible situation. But at the same time, we also knew from experience, there's usually a second attack. So you can't just go in there and do that. You've got to go secure a wide area around that to protect the people doing this. Very complicated operation. I couldn't have been more proud of my folks. Um, and, but the, again, I had a, an amazing team that we grew, built, and trained, mentored, developed. Um, and, and I didn't go to the site very often. I, I, I picked my number, my, my deputy commander, I sent him there with a handful of key people that I knew I could count on, and they made it happen. Remarkable. And that's what happens when you let people do their jobs. Um, you can kind of see they had to fly everything out. And so I'm going to get into expeditionary leadership real briefly because those were the tools that allowed us to succeed in Afghanistan. Those are the tools that have allowed me to succeed in the private sector. And, and there's just a little list of folk, little list of things that we look for as attributes. As a leader, you got to lead from the front. Um, in the Army, uh, they teach us you eat last. You're responsible for ordering the rations. If there's not enough there, you don't eat. It's your fault. You don't eat first. Um, when, the, when the soldiers endure certain pains and challenges, you're right there with them. Um, there's a picture of me right now briefing General William Wallace um, back in 2003. And I was at uh, Ballard Air Base, and I had to explain to him that with a, we were extremely shorthanded, but I had to secure this base that would eventually hold 35,000 folks. I had an odd experience where an Air Force colonel came up to me and asked me if I was responsible for security, and I said, yeah. The base was under attack every day, by the way. And I said, yeah. And he said, I need you to sign this document. And I said, what is it? And he said, you're confirming that it's safe to land airplanes there. I'm thinking, no, it's not. <laughs> I wouldn't. And I said, well, what if I don't sign it? And he said, well, we won't be bringing in any supplies. And I said, you mean the fresh fruit, the mail, vegetables, the food, the water? Yeah. I said, oh, yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're going to do with this contract later if it's not. Um, but because it was not mine to mix and match and use some initiative and innovation, there was an aviation unit on, on post that was not mine, but they lived there, so they had a vested interest. So if you look at a, a perimeter of a thing as a big circle, 360 degrees, I would cut out chunks of the circle and give responsibility to other organizations um, and say to the helicopters, every time you fly out today, I need you to go to the top right corner. 
and fly in and out and check it. They're going to think you're doing something. It's a bluff. But you, know, you might see something, you can call us and we can send land, land troops. We had long range reconnaissance units that would go out and they would exfiltrate on foot. And I say, okay, you guys go in and out this side. And so through a hodgepodge means, I was able to cover all 100, 360 degrees one way or another, sorta. But as good as I could. I briefed that to uh, General Wallace and he liked it. He understood we showed initiative and things were going well. We were, we were raiding weapons markets. We were getting all sorts of you know, lethal weapons off the street that were gonna come at us. Um, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but lead from the front, flexibility, agility, adaptability, innovation. You guys know all these words, um, but challenge every premise. Don't accept anything for fact. I, I bought that bridge so many times early on in my career where I'd get intelligence reports that would tell me something and it was not true. Or somebody would say, this is the way we need to do it and somehow I thought they knew something that they didn't know. Challenge every assertion and every premise so that you've got a good foundation to build your plan. Um, if you don't challenge it, that's on you. If you take somebody's word for it that that's okay and this works, nobody would do that with a contractor. But you certainly wouldn't do it with your life and you shouldn't do it with your business. Um, strategic vision. Part of what I talked about earlier with your intelligence, and, and it's called informed decision making, is you've got to have that, you've got to be able to have good situational awareness and the best intelligence you can have to make a good decision. But as you do that, it gives you the ability to look beyond the horizon and see emerging opportunities before everybody else does or emerging threats and challenges. The pandemic is the best example. Talk about a slow curveball coming for your forehead. We all watched the news and they talked about the virus in China and it was getting worse. And then we heard it was in England. And you know, and, and we, it's like the slow rolling monster coming at us and everybody was kind of bracing for it, sort of. I, I'm fortunate I work with Mass General and Mass General Brigham. We had teams working on this starting in early February trying to figure out what could happen because they were in contact open source, nothing magical like anybody could have with their friends in London because London got hit before us. They're like two weeks ahead of us and they had friends in China and they were talking to their friends in China. So they were making the plans to be prepared and that was why they built Boston Hope was they knew we were going to get overwhelmed and if we didn't have that outlet for 750 people, the, the emergency rooms would get overwhelmed, the dike would overflow and we would have a problem. Um, so strategic vision is important so that you see those opportunities and those threats. And then finally, we talk about disrupt the status quo. Um, I would tell you that I have two strong beliefs on this. Number one, mediocrity sucks. And people that believe in mediocrity sometimes have a casual relationship with integrity. So that's another reason why I don't trust people that love mediocrity. Um, what I believe is status quo was somebody else's solution to a previous problem. And if you want to be a caretaker, a manager type person just to manage the things you have, that's fine. But leaders want the ball. They, they want to have an opportunity to do something cool. They want to advance the situation. They want to build something new. You got to disrupt that. You got to find what's the new way forward and never accept status quo. Um, when I arrived in Balad, I didn't have any intelligence and we had to create those situations. And that was back in the Sunni Triangle. What we found very quickly was something opposite, and I shared that with you a few moments ago. The place was really bad. We were getting every, everything, every convoy came, came in, got hit. Um, we got 20 to 25 rounds of incoming mortar every day. Uh, my initial mission told me just to protect the base and build a perimeter. But we knew that we had to innovate. We had to get out of the base, and I immediately claimed 10 square kilometers, uh, nautical miles in every direction of the base, because that was the area of influence. And as we look at any type of business decision, decision you're going to make, you've got to look at the areas of influence, your supply chain, right? Uh, what, what's the biggest problem right now going on in America? All our supply chains are messed up because we got all these cheap different parts from different parts of the world that can't get us those little parts anymore. Without the little parts, we can't put the big parts together. Um, so anything that is going to influence your operation, you've got to understand it, know it, and be able to affect it. If you can't, then your best bet, and you almost have a, a responsibility to figure out a new solution. It doesn't mean it's all going to change overnight because you may not be able to grow those things, but you should begin trying to figure out how to control your own destiny. I already talked about leading from the front. Um, my soldiers thought I was crazy because I showed up at night patrols every night. I showed up at day patrols every day. 
I went on a different patrol randomly. We'd have five or six going out and I would just pick one. I wouldn't let anybody know because then I could listen to the patrol brief. I could see that they are all doing their job. And what, what they, one of the things about leadership is you don't want to micromanage, but you want to spot check to make sure what you say to do is actually being translated down at the lowest possible level. Uh, I learned a great lesson from General, and he, he called it periscopes. He had periscopes of leadership at every level in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he met different people along his travels. And so he might send a lieutenant that was five levels down, a quick email saying, hey, did you hear about the operation we're doing? What do you think? And if the kid said, I don't know what you're talking about, Houston, we got a problem. He gave the order two days ago, it's gonna take off in two days, and the guy that should be executing hasn't got the word yet. And he would also get feedback. Yeah, this is a screwed up plan. And the kid would tell him that because he wanted to hear it. You gotta be willing to listen to constructive criticism, much like my wife does once in a while. Because for the overall, it is good. And she did warn me about a catastrophic event going on in the city I was in command of. You gotta listen, right? Um, so you gotta lead from the front. I talked a little bit about the disruptive leadership part. You gotta challenge everything. The guy in the top left corner, um, I've got advanced slides if you can see what I'm talking about. Oh, we're way behind, aren't we? So the guy in the top left corner was a bomb maker. And he had, and you can see some of the stuff. We took these type of caches off the street every day in our raids. We had, our intelligence network was pretty good. I had one guy um, that was a spy for us. His father was the head of the Republican Guards and he had daddy issues. He hated his father. He wanted us to shoot him, arrest him, anything we could. And the father would drag him around to all his meetings and make him sit there. And so he would write notes and give us an eight digit coordinate on the next meeting. Who was there? And if you've ever seen those FBI organized crime things where they have the wire diagram about the leaders and all that, we had all those guys, but he would take pictures with them and give us the pictures. So we had their faces, and so we, when we splinted that front door, executed a raid at their house, them not knowing we knew who they were, we would just hold up a picture next to their face, and they're like, no, that's not me. I'm like, oh yeah, it is. <laughs> um, we had another guy that was a mercenary. He did it for the money. Um, and we had another one that was a teacher, and he did it for idealistic reasons. He wanted a better uh, Iraq. Whenever we had a situation when all three gave me the same information, intelligence on something, we knew it was gold. And, and there were some incredible opportunities. And this, that's that guy in the top left. He was making bombs, and one of those bombs actually killed one of our soldiers. It was an old artillery shell um, that was set on the side of the road, roadside bomb, and it took out a tank. And so you can, you can imagine how big this explosion was. And he bragged uh, to all his folks, because again, we had spies everywhere, and they found him that he was gonna go down fighting. He was gonna take us to the last man. And so we set up this raid to get him because he had actually killed one of our guys. And so, complex raid, set it all up, executed it flawless, the block, bad intel. We were one block off. We had circled the block, we had come down, searched everything, and all of a sudden we had to get, you know, somebody that knew, brought him down, they're like, maybe it's that one. Sure enough, that's where he was. We got him finally, by the way, he didn't get down fighting. He actually wet his pants, um, literally, um, and was crying. Um, the key, that, key for us though was we were able to stop somebody that had caught a, caused a catastrophic injury based on good intelligence. And if we hadn't listened to it, and we hadn't, if we'd given up after the first one and not given it that one more effort, we would not have captured that guy and we probably would have sustained more casualties. I talked about the fact that if you have the right people and stuff, you can accomplish anything. And so building a great team is the key. Uh, you've got to resource them, but you've got to develop them, nurture them. You've got to work with them to try and maximize their potential so they see a future. If they don't see a future in an organization, then they're just an employee. And you don't want employees, you want team members. And team members will drive success. And as I mentioned, even if you're short on some of the right resources, you can figure it out if you have the right people. If you don't take care of them, as they're seeing across the country, their next boss will. Uh, you guys can figure that one out. <laughs> and as I mentioned a moment ago, leaders provide purpose, direction, and resources, and then empower their, their subordinate team members. Um, I'm gonna take a second and just talk about values. In the, in the Army, we have uh, seven values. Loyalty, duty, respect, honor, integrity, and personal coverage. I, I can't find anything wrong with any one of those. Um, 
I always tell people as you're developing your corporate culture, your corporate values, take a look at what the Army's got, take a look at the Marines got, they're pretty succinct, somebody spent millions of dollars trying to figure them out, and then modify them off there. But every one of those is fairly good. I would tell you if you're not a values-based organization, you've got problems coming in your future at some point. Someone's going to cut corners, someone's going to go across a gray line a little bit. Um, it's not a great idea. If you've got a good set of um, leaders with a good, strong, functioning moral compass, and you've got good corporate culture and values, that can serve as your organizational North Star. And if you've got a good moral compass and a good organizational North Star, your company will never get in trouble and people will like to work with you. Everybody knows sketchy organizations, nobody wants to be around them because they know sooner or later something bad's coming out and it's gonna splatter on you. Last point on that one is optimism. It's contagious. Um, perpetual optimism is the best thing. It's a combat multiplier, it's a force uh, multiplier. It can drive success. Positive attitude is something you can't replicate, and if you can maintain that, people figure out stuff built to positive. Negative attitude will get negative results every time. And so you got, even during the most difficult time, I had a captain when I was a young lieutenant that no matter what we did, if we were in the, if we were in the rain, pouring rain, he'd say, isn't it great out today? No, <laughs> this stinks, I'm miserable. And he goes, well, you get to be miserable if you want, or you're gonna be happy. And I, he goes, Jack, it's, it's 70 degrees, it's raining, it's no big deal. Now, if it was like 40, that would stink. No, winter training exercise, same type of thing. X, it's freezing. How come you smile? He goes, well, this is the good kind of cold. <laughs> Snow's dry. If this was wet snow, this would stink. And so I, after I peeled the onion back over a beer, he explained that he had spent a year in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam where, where it was typhoon weather the entire time he was there while people were trying to shoot at him. I really valued my time in the desert when I heard that. It's hot, it was 130 degrees, but I wasn't soggy wet all the time. And what he learned was, you can either be happy or you can be sad, you get to choose that, but either way, that's how you're gonna be living. And I decided at that moment that I'll always be positive and I'll always try and encourage people to be positive because you can inspire people to be better than they were and, and maximize their potential. Or, I've seen the same people, and we all know them, all they do is talk about bummer stuff and they, and they don't want to do anything and they drag the organization down. So optimism is contagious. Reimagine what's possible. As I talked about this, you got to look beyond the horizon and I always love stealing a quote from Wayne Gretzky to skate to where the puck's going to be, not where it is. The trajectory of planning, and I've done that in many different environments, you don't want to look at the conditions today and develop a solution for today because it takes time to get there. And by the time you get there, you're, behind, you're throwing the past behind the person. You want to you wanna build the trajectory once you know what you want to do, and then you've got to do that informed decision making, that situational awareness to kind of get a sense of where are we going to be by the time we're able to deliver this, and then aim it just a little bit ahead to stretch the organization and the program. Fill the void. That, that, that is something we very much had to do in, in, in several operations I've been involved with over the years. But when, I was in, when we were involved with that uh, situation um, with the uh, U.S. Embassy under attack, I mentioned before the Turkish brigade was responsible for a lot of this stuff, and we found out later that the Turkish commander had locked himself in his office so nobody could reach him, and then feign anger and frustration that no one called him. If he doesn't get a call, he didn't turn it down. If he didn't turn it down, he didn't go because we didn't ask him to go, not because he refused to go. So it was this weird game. Um, General John Allen replaced General Petraeus, um, and he was now my senior raider, and he came down to pin some medals on my guys for some of the heroic stuff they did. And as I walked him back to the helicopter, I said, sir, I, I want to thank you for coming today, but I also want to take a minute to apologize to you in advance for some of the things I'm going to be doing. And without, he was good, and without skipping a beat, he looked at me, he goes, well, just don't do them. And I said, well, mm, that's not going to happen. And he goes, okay, what's happening? And so I explained to him that up until now, I had been stepping all over the Turks' terrain, doing what was right, securing our, our, our province. And I said, based on their inability and their refusal to respond, the gloves are off. I'm not even gonna, I'm gonna step hard now. Now I'm gonna bang on them pretty good. And so he looked at me and he grabbed the back of my head like some people do and he did like a head bump, like, like we were gonna mind meld for a second. I'm like, this, and my, my operations officer, my, my deputy commander, my sergeant major were just about four feet away 
and I'm, I'm feeling awkward and uncomfortable because I don't know him that well, and he's got this head-to-head conversation going on, but he said, in combat, much like business, with the moving and shaking and the disruption, there are voids created, spaces created that nobody claims. And in the military and combat, whoever claims them first wins. And so he said, fill the void. Screw the Turks. And so it was great because I now had carte blanche from the ISAF commander to do what I want. And when I say that, he didn't really give that to me, but I, I took that. And as I looked at my uh, deputy commander, my sergeant major, they both shook their head and they said, he's gonna regret saying that to you. <laughs> because now when anyone asked me what I was doing, I said, General Allen told me I could do it. Fill the void. That was a direct order. How I fill the void is up to me. And for the rest of my time in Afghanistan, I filled the void how I saw fit and all the naysayers and the ankle biters that would try and say, no, you can't, we don't have this. I, I just said, well, go ask General Allen then because he told me to do it, that's on you. And they're like, oh, okay, well, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can do it. And a lot of people bluff you, um, but fill the void. That's important. And then I talked about mediocrity already. And the final one's go big or go home. You only get one spin at the wheel in life. Embrace the opportunities that you have. Those are critical. You want to do everything you can to make the most. If you're going to spend eight hours away from your family, 10 hours away from your family, doing the things that you enjoy at work, do them well and, and make, them, make them important to you. Because if they're important to you, they're going to be important and you're going to be proud of them. You can look back and say, you know, we did pretty good on that one. And you can remember that that time spent away from home on this project mattered. Um, John talked briefly about the Boston Hope thing. That was one of those experiences. When the governor called, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I actually thought because we had that crisis out at the Holyoke Soldiers Home, um, we lost 95 veterans there. I was afraid he was gonna ask me to do something with that and I was terrified of that because that was a sinkhole. That had so many layers of problems. And you might've seen, they've had attorney generals looking at it. They've had criminal investigations at it. That was not something I, I needed to get bogged down in. Um, and I, had ex I didn't have expertise in, in elder care or anything like that, and it, it didn't feel right. And so when he texted me initially, I was like, yee. And I was on a call with Ann Klebanski and the partners team talking about what we were going to do. Um, and then he called. He gave it a 30 seconds when I didn't respond to a text. The governor does that. Um, and he said, I, I got to ask you a favor. Can you do this? And I said, of course. You know, when you talk about build a, a field hospital. And um, I knew what was at stake, and I'd been part of the partners' discussions. I said, absolutely, no problem. He goes, you might want to think about it. And I said, no, nah, I don't need a minute. I I'm good. And so I said, great. And I said, now that we're there, I said, I'll ask you the questions I always ask when I get a mission. Where's the money coming from to pay for it? And he said, we don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where are the people coming that are going to work at it? And he said, yeah, we don't know. And I said, okay. And I said, when do you want this ready? And he said, oh, 10 days. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you, we had to construct a thousand bed hospital in 10 days. When I say construct, all thousand beds had a room, sheetrock, with wiring, copper tubing for breathing. We had six intensive care rooms. 500 had to be for uh, homeless in Boston that were COVID positive. Um, and the other half were folks coming out of all the hospitals that were acute, post-acute care. Anybody that knew what they were doing in that field was all hands on deck in everybody's hospital. So only we had, we didn't have access to any of them. The only ones we could have access to are people that had no relationship in medicine to those areas. So it was an interesting environment. We built together a team, just as we talked about. You gotta get that core group of people that you know you can trust. And one of them was uh, Dr. Jeanette Ives Erickson, former chief nurse of Mass General for 25 years. One of the first picks. Um, my chief operating officer, Mike Allard, at home base was the first guy I called just to let him know, hey, I'm going away for a little bit. And he goes, can I come? <laughs> sure, now I got two. Because I, I sat there, I'm like, I'm an army of one. We got to hire a thousand people. We got to train them as a team. We got to train them in new skills. We've got to get all the equipment for a hospital. We don't have that. We don't have the bed. We don't have beds. We don't have computers. And, and re remarkably, we were able to hire 700 people that had been laid off. They all did outpatient care, nothing related to what we were doing, so we had to train them. Each hospital system, competing hospital systems in Boston, contributed key doctors and nurses to, to build a central team from which we could cascade out. We developed an amazing plan that we just built 40 bed wards, one at a time, staffed them on a rolling basis, and then started taking uh, patients. 
And we took patients on day 10. Um, I'm sorry, day seven. So by seven, we did it. Uh, we had Suffolk Construction working three shifts to build the thing. Um, while we had Mass General coming in with infectious disease to make sure they built it right and they had to make adjustments. But hiring a thousand people, training them as teams, cohesive teams to take very, very sick people uh, was remarkable. And we were able to build on that. We treated 750 COVID patients without a death or a safety violation, which was remarkable with a pickup team. Um, and we were able, also able to enhance it because we started reimagining what was possible based on other experiences and we, they all got mental health care while they were there because it was a very poor population um, that, that came to us um, and it was part of that disparity in care that we were seeing. Uh, we had a lot of Spanish speaking folks that English was a second language. We had to figure out how to solve that. We had psychiatry appointments using iPads, which home base then took after that because we figured out how to solve a COVID problem. Um, and then we had mental health um, support for the staff and we're all hearing about the nursing challenges and et cetera. We started doing that, that because we found a nurse after a shift in the fetal position in the locker room. Um, and we knew we had a problem. So we had the mental health team from Mass General come down and work stress reduction, anxiety reduction issues. And then we had lunchtime music seminars. We've already talked about uh, Mass, uh, Mass General Home Base Program. We've been able to reimagine, I've talked about that. Amazing program, but I'm kind of getting right back to the end. Uh, we were able to take all those tools and skills over all those years and kind of piece them together. But this time, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not working on government subsidies of equipment that they might give me, not get, will give me, won't give me. My, my, my unit went to Iraq with no body armor. We didn't have up armor and Humvees. We had canvas door Humvees with fiberglass doors. Um, Swiss cheese as far as bullets goes. Going into this environment, working with the team we have now and leveraging the incredible resources of Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, Spalding, the Mass General Brigham system and the Red Sox, you know, to use a bad baseball metaphor, we started out on third base, but we've been able to really bring it home and then develop new and innovative treatment models that are, are changing and saving lives every day. Um, I'm just gonna end with this last side. Um, you can read those. If you don't lead from the front or set the example, you can't expect others to do it on your team. Uh, build and empower teams to max their, their uh, potential is, is really crucially important. You've got to become an agile thinker, a problem solver, and a go-to person. Uh, all the great leaders I know are consummate learners, always reading more, trying to learn more about their craft. Question everything. Be flexible and adaptive. Maintain your strong uh, moral compass. Uh, but be dis disciplined and respectful. You gotta accept, accept mistakes. You, you never accomplish anything great without making mistakes. That's just a known. Uh, you gotta accept them, you just don't make them twice. And then finally, stay positive, optimism will carry the day. That's all I've got. If you've got any questions, I think I went close to my time. I don't have to go. If you do have questions, I'm happy to answer them. I just wanted to be respectful. Uh, sorry. Um, one, thank you. Um, I would love to uh, be a doctor by the family. So I would be there and talk to you. Because it's just So, I mean, um, middle class family running, you know, in the town, probably lower end of the middle class. Dad was a federal investigator. Um, but I think I think the best part of my family was we had a good family, like we were tight, close. Um, we lost a brother when we were young, and I think that brought us a little tighter. Um, but when, when I got ready to graduate high school, my dad said, so what are you gonna do next year? And I said, I'm going to college. And he said, really? Don't be that surprised. <laughs> Second question, how are you gonna pay for it? You know, big family and modest means. And I said, I'll figure it out. 
And he said, that's all right. He went over the beer, over the refrigerator, cracked two beers, and he said, congratulations. <laughs> so that was the prep work. And, you know, I, I, um, I was interested in wrestling at the time. I wrestled in college. I played lacrosse one year. Uh, I was more interested in that than academics at the time. And it was kind of a waste. Of, you know, college I got through. Uh, but I, I was able to start figuring out you gotta, you got to spend more time and learn. And I had that opportunity to go back to BU and teach for three years, and I got a master's in communication. And it's, one of the, it's really one of the top schools in the country for that. Um, we had a medical challenge in the family, and so my wife and I created a nonprofit research foundation in my mid-career. Um, and so I used the, the work products from my master's program for the foundation. So everything I did, I had a kind of double purpose on. But as, as, I, as I learned, you know, and there's a good expression, see students rule the world. <laughs> I had a um, coach at a party, it was a, Pop Warner, a bunch of guys I grew up with, Pop Warner football, 1970, C team. Um, we had our reunion thing, and he looked over and he goes, and my, my, both my brothers were very successful again, and they both did well. And he said, damn it, boys, who would have thought? <laughs> so, to give you a point, it, it's a lot of good opportunities, good mentors along the way. But I, I will tell you it's one thing, and I, I forgot to mention this, it's the willingness to step through the looking glass. There's so many people that tell you they could have, would have, or should have, because they didn't. And every time you step through the looking glass into the unknown for an opportunity, you're assuming some personal risk in your, in your professional career, your personal life. You know, there's so many different pieces to it. But, you, you know, you don't do it frivolously, but when you do do it, you do it with an informed kind of thought, and you say, yeah, I feel good about this, I'm gonna do it, and, and you know. And then, then, you, then you burn the light bulbs and commit to it. Because a lot of folks give themselves an out. Don't give yourself an out. When, when you commit to a course of action, burn the light bulbs and go all in. And, you know, and if it fails, it fails. You start over again, and you try something new, because if you don't try something, you can't fail, and you can't succeed. Excuse me, thank you. Um, my question is just this, because this applies to all of us at Boathouse. Was there something poignant in your life as a young man or before you went into the service that um, influenced your mindset to be able to adapt to change and be able to do what you did in the service and come up with plans the way that you did? So uh, there's, there's an expression in the military that they actually teach you that says no plan survives contact. You, you just come up with the best plan you can and know that it's going to fall apart, but you've got to be able to adjust. Folks that get too rigid and try and follow something to the letter don't anticipate all the gremlins out there, the technological gremlins. Um, I, I took a leap of faith today by working on my iPad just because I ran out of time yesterday. I always have it printed out. I always have it in a little case with plastic protectors because I've had a speech disintegrate in the rain before. <laughs> Again, lesson learned, right? But I, I think, you know, for me, it, the, the turning point for me was Iraq. You know, to, to Afghanistan to some degree because they derailed us and we had to work through it. But um, when we got to Iraq, it was, it, 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 it's, it's a large-scale combat operation. It was fluid. And frankly, they did, they did a really good job. There's different phases of an operation, but phase three is the combat operation. The other two are leading up to it. Phase four is after you've won, what are you going to do? There was no phase four plan. I know it. I was there. They said, they gave one line thing, implement stability and security operations. What does that mean? How do you, how? <laughs> Right? And so we had to figure it out. And, and that's really what it came from. You had to figure out, but the, the, the knife cuts two ways. No one's telling you what to do. And, and I, I love that part of having a blank canvas and, let, and chart my own course. Because anytime I could do it, just like I did after General Allen gave me that green light to do whatever I wanted, I loved it because once you get those second, third, fourth, fifth rotations, the rules come in and we call it the stupid shit factor. Where, where they come up with bureaucratic impediments to success. Um, and, and I've always hated those, right? And, and going back to Afghanistan, having been there in 2002, going back there in 2010, 11, and 12, 
I was worried about that more than anything because everybody in the world would want to help me with my job um, as if they didn't have enough to do for themselves, right? And no, you shouldn't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. You should, you should build this lease for a parking lot the size of this room um, to $15 million a year because they want that. And it's like, no, I won't give you anything. And then the guy settled for 400,000. Um, but having that freedom, I think is huge because you, you, your destiny now relies on you. But anyone that thinks they can do it themselves is a fool because you gotta work the collective intelligence of your leadership team. Because as we all know, I might have a good idea, but when I bounce it off you, it gets better. If we bounce it off three or four trusted agents, we got something really good at the end of this. And if you think you've got it all, you don't. And that's why you're constantly evolving and iterating and becoming better. My reading's like my music, it's all over the place. I think if one of my shrinks got a hold of my music list, they, they might check me out for a while. I mean, it, it goes from country west into the clash. Um, but when it comes to books, I, 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 do, I do a lot of biographies. Um, and then I also do a lot of Clancy type books. And, and by the way, there's a lot more truth in those than people think. You know, when they talk about um, at least four books I've read in the last five years, have shown kind of what's going on in Ukraine now where Russia went into some Eastern European country to do something bad and then the US implemented sanctions. So when somebody said, how do you think Putin's gonna respond? I go, I don't know, if he read half the books I've read, he knows we're gonna do that, right? Um, but I've also read history because history does repeat itself and I just finished an amazing book that covered the entire uh, land campaign for the European war in World War II. And I knew it pretty well, but this, got in, this was well, well researched and it got into the very um, detailed stories. And when you, when you start hearing that, a lot of times I just use that for my own mental agility to think, what would I have done if I had faced that? What do I do? And, and as my wife said, it's, it, it's painful to be around me sometimes because with the way my brain works, um, I can be sitting at the line at, you know, a sub shop going, I'd move that over there and I'd move that over there. And I'd move that. <laughs> if you can't shut it off and you just don't try not to say that to anybody. Um, but my brain doesn't work well in a lot of ways, right? I, you know, I, I took six years of Spanish and I'm, I, I go to Paraguay and I'm talking like a first grader. Um, this certain, I can't play an instrument. I had a house full of instruments when my kids were little, you know, pianos, trumpets, you name it, guitars. Yeah, no, nothing. So we all have different things, you know, you, so you, you, you know, exploit your strengths, manage your weaknesses. And so you try and find complementary people with the skill sets you don't have. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like, tactics that you use to convince others who are, oh, sorry, who are afraid to make risk regardless of how much data you have, just convincing them to follow your leadership? Yeah, I, so the, the first thing, you know, it's always best to try and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation because if you if you're trying to convince somebody of something they, they're kind of digging in on and you do it in front of other people, there's a natural tendency to dig in. Um, so I try and bring people, you know, go grab lunch with them and have a conversation, time permitting. I mean, the, the beautiful part in the Army is, you know, if it's a high op tempo situation, it's like, yeah, thanks, no. But in the private sector you have to do that and I would tell you I you know I learned a valuable lesson when I came to work at MGH and, and John you're familiar with a lot of the people there I talked with um, the, the, the chair of psychiatry and there were 18 chiefs and chairs of different departments at Mass General and after I was hitting a lot of headwind on creating this 14-day intensive clinical program they started having me meet with Jerry Rosenbaum um, once a month for one-on-one, -on -one, we kind of talked through the issues and challenges. I still think it was to check on me. Um, but Jerry talked to me one day, he goes, I know you're frustrated. And he goes, you know, I know you used to just say and do it. And I said, no, nah, that's a misconception of the Army. I, I, have, I have trusted advisors that I talk to. At the end, it's my responsibility to make the decision, but I do listen to all sides because you get a better product. I said, I'm just frustrated that we kind of got where we are and it's still dragging and, and people are dying. And he said, yeah, no, I, I hear you. He said, at Mass General, we have 18 chiefs. And if 17 out of the 18 chiefs agree to something, what do you think we call that? And I said, landslide victory. And he goes, a good start. 
we still got one. And when we get that last one though, we move heaven and earth and throw every resource we have at the problem and we get it done. And, and so that, that to me, you know, lifelong learner, that was a valuable lesson. And so although I've had a lot of yin to my yang, professionally, especially in the private sector, I'm surrounded by doctors that all went to Harvard. I'm the dumbest guy coming into the room every day. So I gotta work on my wits. I've gotta be agile, adaptive. Um, but I do have to listen because I don't have all the, and by the way, we're talking about oh, medical. I'm a soldier. When they asked me to run Boston Hope, I, I have a daughter that just abuses me on this stuff. And she said, yeah, that makes perfect sense he'd call you because there's nobody in Boston with any experience in hospitals. That, so again, that's my family, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I think working it offline and trying to show them why they're. I, I had a sergeant major, um, and so in the, in the structure of the military, um, there's officers, and there's non-commissioned officers, and there's enlisted soldiers. And the non-commissioned officers are the backbone of the Army, and at every level of command, you have a partner. So as a platoon leader, as a lieutenant, I had a platoon sergeant who's my alter ego. He's got seven to 10 years in the Army, I've got a year. And so he's supposed to offset any weaknesses I have. I have much higher professional education than he does. As a captain, I have 200 soldiers and I have a first sergeant, and then we have four lieutenants and four platoon sergeants and 200 soldiers. And so he's the guy I talk to if there's an issue that I'm not comfortable with or I need advice, or when I tell him what to do, he's gonna give me feedback and honest feedback, and that's his job to do that. And so as a, as a colonel, and then on up, you have a sergeant major, command sergeant major, and these guys are good. My command sergeant major had fought two tours in Vietnam. He was in the Iraq war and he was with me in Fallujah. He had almost 40 years of experience and everything good, bad, or indifferent, he'd been around it. And he had taught me a lesson back in the early 80s and he said, you know, you're an officer and I have to do what you say. You can make me do it, but I can make you wish you hadn't. <laughs> and I would tell you, remember that one, because I learned that in 1987 and as the boss, you can tell anybody, we're gonna do this, and they're gonna go, sure. Half-heartedly and mistakes, and we used to have lieutenants that would pull rank on that platoon sergeant, and then all of a sudden they'd be off messing off somewhere, and the, as a captain, I'd come in and say, hey, where's the lieutenant? Good lieutenant, good work and relationship, he could be out screwing off. And they'd say, oh, sir, he went down to the motor pool, he's taking care of some stuff, there was an issue with a soldier, and it's like, okay. But you knew he was covering for him, so you also know there's a good dynamic there. Other response. Where's the lieutenant? <laughs> he didn't throw him under the bus, but all he did was shrug, and I went, oh. The fact that he threw him under the bus, you knew there's a problem. So anyway, um, I, I, you don't want to force somebody into something without at least trying to give it to them. But as Costa told me, he goes, my job though is to present an argument against what you want to do if I believe it, but at the end of the day, if I can't convince you you are wrong, then I have to tip my flag to you because you are in command and you're responsible for the decision. And so he understood that part of it and he said, it's his job to convince me I'm wrong if he can't, then he's got to go along with it and then support it 110%. And so I say that, you've got to be a good leader and a good follower. You never, nobody doesn't have a boss at some point and that's what we would always share with them is, Ultimately, I appreciate your input, but when we say we're going on this course of action, everybody's got to roll. Oh, I've never had to use one of these before, but <laughs> usually uh, they're taking it away. When we were thinking about, like, you come in, we're, the, the business that we're in is, is is focused a lot on narrative, and I was thinking about how uh, you know war, war fighting is very narrative based, like the Marines with Bella Wood or, or the Chosen Reservoir or the armored personnel carrier that you had to move because it told a story that was not. And then thinking about what you guys do at home base with the a lot of the the. Uh, Trauma is addressed through narratives, addressed through telling those stories the most awful day. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on narrative and, and, and the role, because uh, I'm obsessed with what I do and I always try and bring it into everything. Yeah, so I, I go back to narrative, right? So the, the, out of all the branches of the military, you hit a raw nerve with me. The Marine Corps has the best PR. I swear to God. So 
Who won the war in the Pacific for the U.S. military? Everyone says the Marine Corps. So if you look at the military, the U.S. forces in World War II, the Army had 100 combat divisions. The Marine Corps had six. In the Pacific, the Army had 20 combat divisions. The Marine Corps had six. They fought in all the same campaigns. They lost a lot more people. They won just as many battles. But from the halls of Montezuma, every, high, every grandma school kid knows the Marine Corps him because they have the best PR machine. Today in the, in the world, the Marine Corps has 190,000 troops. The Army has 1.1 million. When we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had 120,000 troops fighting in Iraq. The Marine Corps had 25,000. And, and, and by the way, heroes, they all do great things. We could just send one more division. <laughs> but they are, they are a remarkable group of young men and women. Uh, they are heroes to the core, but because they have this amazing branding, they have this amazing narrative. Um, prior to World War I, they weren't even involved in any U.S. war. They just worked on the ships and protected, they were naval infantry to protect the captain and the ship from boarding parties. That's it. Revolution, Civil War, Spanish-American War, any of those wars, they weren't involved in the least. World War I, they had 20,000 troops there. The Army had a million. And so Patton and all those guys bristled when they hear about Bellow Woods because they were part of the 2nd Infantry Division, <laughs> U.S. Army. They had a brigade there, and that transformed them. But the stories, and they had press there, they told these vivid stories, and that talks about how well you market yourself. Everybody in the world thinks the U.S. Marine Corps is it. When you look at the fact that the Army's got five special forces groups, they've got three Army Ranger regiments, that, you know, the Marine Corps Special Operations Unit, it's about 10,000 guys. Um, we've got Delta Force, you know what I mean? But the Halls of Montezuma is known by every kid, and so that, that is one of the best marketing things that, that was ever done by anybody. And the Marine loves it too. That when, you, when you tell them that, they're just like, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Are they born leaders or they are uh, taught to be leaders? Yeah, that, that's one of those age-old questions. Um, and, and I would tell you, no one is a completely born leader. Some people have attributes um, that, that help set the path for that, maybe. Um, and I, I think, you know, what we do, a lot of times we look and see how people do on the sports field. Um, that, you know, that they, they played a lot of sports, they were team captains on sports, because that's an early indication that others thought they were pretty good as rallying a team and so forth. But it's not the end-all, be-all. And I would tell you, all too often, you see a person, they call them spotlight rangers. When the spotlight's on them, they're doing everything right. And when you're in peacetime, and you're doing it eight hours a day, you can put on a good show. Um, but the true measure of a person is during a crisis, or in our case, during a deployment, where the spotlight's on you 24-7. And we saw so many folks that were just quiet professionals that didn't seek the limelight, that weren't in the limelight, that shone. And we saw so many folks that we thought, and we put a lot of stock in that, you know, he or she is just a stud, and they turned out to be a dud. Um, so after that first deployment experience, I saw that firsthand, I saw some folks fall apart that I really had a great deal of respect for, and, and they really turned to trash. Um, in some cases, did some pretty bad things, when I say that internally, nothing like war crimey, y um, but they, they were bad people, and they, they, they failed us miserably. Um, and so I stopped doing it then, because it, like I said, until you have that opportunity during a crisis to see the true self, sometimes you don't recognize that. I also taught um, ROTC, I, I, well, I back up, I taught OCS as a TAC officer, and if you've seen Drill Sergeants or the movie Officer and Gentleman, it's a very aggressive yelling and screaming, high intensity environment because you're transforming an enlisted service member into a commissioned officer in a very compressed time period. So it's high impact, high energy, and you want to weed out anybody that's just doing it for the wrong reasons. They want to get more money. They want to boss people around, you know, silly stuff. Brutal on that stuff. You got to want to be there. And we make sure you want to be there because we make life so miserable in that environment. You, you do. By contrast, ROTC 
is like a country club. They're college students. Um, my wife went through uh, ROTC, and when she went through her advanced camp training at Fort Bragg, if she maxed the swim test, she got to go to the officers club and hang out and have lunch. That wasn't even a thought. I mean, we, we couldn't, we'd get, we'd, we'd get a Coke. <laughs> you can get a Coke, yeah, you do, you do great. Um, and they would have, they could go out at night to the bar. Again, things that, that weren't even considered for us, but the reality was 70% of the officers that go in the U.S. Army come from ROTC across the country. We have to support a million man army. And so it's a, it's, we, get, we see a range of people and we see the folks from the military academy, West Point. We see folks from VMI, Citadel, which is pseudo military academies in a sense, Norwich. Um, and then you've got folks that went to OCS. So we've got this broad mix of people and we all come together when we go to our basic course, it, whatever specialty you are, if you're infantry, cavalry, armor, artillery, then all these people mix together and then you get branch qualified in a, in a skill set and you become a cavalry officer, an infantry officer. But when you go there, you encounter all these guys. And, and, and um, you know, we used to laugh because we, we could spot the ROTC kids because the uniforms were a mess. Um, they were college kids that just pinned on a uniform and, you know, and if they came from a good program, they were squared away. If they came from a program that had four students, they were on a first name basis with everybody. And it was kind of a fun, it was like a club. Um, but we all bring them together and then water rises to its level. And we saw folks that were, could have been second in their class at West Point, that once they were actually put in an operational environment would fail. Or, you know, most of our four-star generals at West Point. Um, but Colin Powell was an ROTC student. Uh, and a number of our officers, just because 70% of them come from there, they do exceptionally well. And so you start learning to take, you know, take the raw material and build it. And what we've found over the years is those, when they went to their first assignment, had a very meaningful assignment. They had a mentor, a captain, major, lieutenant colonel, that kind of took them under their wing. That was a pivotal point because they were encouraged, they were supported, uh, and that matters so much more. The training is perfect. You gotta have that, formal military education. That's the baseline. But good experience and then strong mentorship really separates you know, the good from the great and then the great to the excellent. And, and that's what I always look at because when you see people that have good mentors, they thrive. If you see somebody that has to figure it out on themselves, they're chipping their teeth, banging their heads, and I did that for a while. But I found what a difference when I finally got a good mentor. And then when I didn't have one, you felt you feel adrift because you want that person to talk to when you have a tough time because you don't have all the answers, especially when you're a junior and mid-career person. But miraculously, when you're actually seeking those people out, you can find them because you know it's usually someone you respect. And someone you respect, you respect them for all the values they possess. And when you ask them for some advice, um, they'll, they'll usually do pretty good by you, and then you build that relationship. But that's how it's grown. They're not grown. You start with some good material, but it's really all true leaders are developed. Um, we, uh, we talk a lot about um, seeing opportunity when it comes. In your experience, have you found that um, the need to innovate happens and you realize it in the moment, or do you experience a lot where you see it coming? So part of it is you, you have to be looking for it. By the time it just pops up and it's obvious to everybody, it's, it's, it's passing you by. It's like, you know, you're looking out the window and it's, the billboard's right there. You're, the exits, you already missed the exit. Um, you've got to be looking for it and open to it. A lot of people are just focused on getting through today. Do you know what I mean? Because we all have tough times. We have, we have to juggle family, relationships, employment, if you've got a hobby, if you golf, you know, all those things get managed. So a lot of people shy away from new things because I got too much on my plate. And, and that's, that's what I run into more on the naysayers. They've got too much on their plate. They don't want to do something more. And I, I got to tell you, one of my biggest frustrations still at home base is when we talk about innovative new programs, uh, like with the Apache, Hopi, Navajo, they're thinking, crap, he's giving us more work. And, and I tell them every single time, a vision without resources is a hallucination. I won't participate. I've participated in hallucinations half my career because I worked with the government. You know, they had all these nice, you know, phrases, do more with less. That just means you're not giving me what I need. But if you want a resource of vision, that's how you succeed. 
Uh, and, and what I've always told them is, look, we're going we're gonna to find a gap. We're going to identify a gap. We're going to build a pilot. We're going to pilot out of pocket. But before we implement, we're going to find a funding source and a scalability plan. And then we're going to drive it just like, you know, going back to what Jerry Rosenbaum said, then we're going to move heaven and earth. Then we're going to bring everything we can to this thing. Um, I had a conversation with Mike Lennington. I told you he was the director of operations in Afghanistan when I was there. And I had that, you know, midnight meeting with him, briefing and conspiring a new mission for my command. Um, Mike is now the CEO for Wounded Warrior Project. Um, and I, I trust him with my life overseas. I trust him with li my life now. And so having a partner organization that's a significant funder of mine as a personal friend and somebody I believe in, um, we had a conversation, you know, the last few months. I need a million and a half dollars to build out more space so I can improve and increase the number of folks I treat through my brain injury program. He's got 140,000 wounded warriors. You know, if you go back to uh, Forrest Gump, this is peas and carrots time. I can do something, he's got people that need it, and that's what he raises a half a billion dollars on every year, right? Um, and so he wants to fund good project. And I, you know, my team has to submit a formal proposal, but I can call him up and say, here's what I'm thinking, what do you think? I like it, put something together. And I already know the boss already said, yeah. we've got to go through the dance and we've got to go through the bean counters, and we've got to do all this other stuff. Um, but he just called last week to say they got a million and a half. We asked for more than we probably should have because we also wanted money to pay a 10 year lease on the property and their contract is only going to go out to five years. And he said, yeah, nice try. <laughs> when we negotiate the next contract, we'll fund five years, but it stops there. Because if we stop funding you, we're not paying for the lease for a building we're not using anymore. You know what I mean? But, but it's straight up and it was a frank conversation. Um, and, and, and so, vision without resources is a hallucination. You've got to resource things, have a plan to scale it up. Uh, but, but again, folks do get nervous about that. You're going to make them do more. And that's a, nat it's a natural response. Because everybody feels overworked. You, and again, then, then you're going to sit down, take them out to lunch have a one-on-one -on -one conversation so you're not fighting a mob. Because you don't want to fight three people, you want to fight one at a time. If, you know, otherwise, collectively, they all adopt everyone else's problem, and now you got a wall you're 